Today, as we move into the rest of the service, this is Future Weekend. Part of what today is all about is sharing with you our future as a church where we believe God is leading us right now and what he's called us to accomplish. We're, we're taking steps right now into our future. We call this campaign in this season, Reach More, because God is calling us to reach more. He's calling us to reach more families, to reach more children, to reach into this community, to make a bigger difference around the world in missions. That's what this whole season is all about. We want to reach more. We want to make that difference. Next week, we're going to give you the details of what that actually means. Today, at the end of the service, we're going to give you a brochure that explains it with the commitment card. We ask that you don't do anything with that now. Just pray over it. Just hold on to it. Begin to pray over it. You can read it, but just begin to pray over it. And over the next couple weeks, we're going to give you all of the details of what it looks like, what it means, what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, what it's going to cost, and how we're going to get there. If you're an engineer, you're really going to like next week because that's when you get all the nuts and bolts. Today, though, what I want to do is as we begin this journey that's going to unfold over the weeks to come, is I want to share with you the why behind the what. What we're doing is important, yes, but why we're doing it is so much more important. And so if you're a visitor and not part of our church family, I'm really glad you're here today because you can understand the why behind who we are as a church a little bit more, that it's all about people. It's all about helping people who are far from God come close to God, helping people know God deep in their faith so that when they go through the challenges of life, they have the faith to endure, the faith to overcome, the faith to see God move in their life and in their family. And that's our dream and our desire. And so as we move into this season that we're calling Reach More, today is the why behind the what. It's all about people. And so I want you to hear this story of a family that was impacted by you as a church, by your generosity, by your service, by what you've done, by what you've given. You're making a difference. And I don't know if, if, if we, we do a good enough job helping you see that, but you're making an incredible difference. And so I want you to watch this story and I want you to just feel the difference that you are making as a church. I grabbed this blanket and I put it in front of my face and I screamed like, like with everything in my body, like, please help him. Like, please end this. No one prepared us for how horrible that 24 hour period is. All right, my name's Chip Beebe. I'm Sarah Beebe. We've been coming to Coastline for seven years. We have three kiddos in the youth and kids program, Shane, Summer, and Curran. On a Sunday, seven years ago, I walked into Coastline, and first I went to the kids' center, and Monica was the first person who greeted me, and immediately, I just was like, I think I love her. I walk into the worship going on, and Amanda comes out. And I love worship. Worship's a very big thing for me for church. And so when I heard her singing, I was like, okay, well, this is like two for two. And then Pastor Aaron came out and it just was it. I knew right then and there it was it. This woman, Mona, walked up to me, sat right next to me, just put her hands on me and started praying for me and just hit every, like everything I needed to, to be prayed for. She just like nailed it. And then the next day after Mona prayed for me, my whole life changed and things I had been praying for for years. I got a job that would launch my career Monday, the day after. So I was like, okay, something powerful happened at Coastline. Little did I know that the next seven years going to Coastline was basically preparing us for the absolute most traumatic season of our life. Sunday morning, Shane started to get really sick. And then that night, everything took a turn for the worse. Yeah, around 12.30, I heard, you know, it sounded like someone got sick. Went into his room and sure enough, he had gotten sick in his bed. And so I was like, all right, dude, let's get up. Let's take a quick shower, let's figure out what's going on. And he stood up and he fell right over. He had no balance. We rushed him down to Rady's and every single marker for bacterial meningitis he had. So we just had to have faith that God would lead our doctors and nurses and save our kid. Like we were, pretty much helpless at that point. I got a call from Chip and he's like, we're going to Reddy's. I was like, I'll meet you there. And when I went in, I saw Shane. No one prepared us for how horrible that 24 hour period is. And it's horrible, it's not your kid. They don't know where they are. 
and they had to do this therapy on Shane's lungs. And it was every four hours and it was this mach machine that would go in his chest and just, just pound it. And he's screaming and he's screaming and he's in pain and he's screaming and it was going on and on. I grabbed this blanket and I put it in front of my face and I like screamed into it, like begging God to just like, please help him, like please. I knew God wasn't doing it. I knew it's the enemy, but like I needed him to show up like I, more than ever. And I screamed while I'm doing that. The screaming stopped and there was like silence and he just laid there and he just like let, he just let them finish. I remember on Tuesday morning, we were having a really bad morning. It was really hard and Pastor Aaron was gonna come down to see us, but we had an episode, I'm gonna say with Shane, and I had to be like, we can't come see you. Like we can't even step out of the room. Things were getting really scary. And a little bit later, um, I felt this weird peace over us, this weird inexplicable peace when things were going really bad in the room. And Pastor Aaron had texted me that they were praying for us at that moment. He's a miracle boy. Every doctor that walked in was like, oh, you're the miracle boy. They hadn't heard a case as bad as Shane's in 20 years. And that word spread very, very fast. And they're like, oh, you're a miracle boy, you're a miracle boy. Like, we can't tell Shane's story without sharing God. Like, we can't, we can't share his story without sharing our faith. And I feel very strongly that if we didn't have God present in that room with us as part of Shane's story, we wouldn't be sharing his story. Like we'd be sharing his eulogy. A reoccurring message in the last seven years that we've been going to Coastline is that God doesn't, he's not the one who causes disease and sickness. It is the broken world we live in. It is the sin. You know, the enemy couldn't take us down. So he was trying to wear us down. So for 18 days, he kept throwing things at us. And I would not, I did not have faith like this before Coastline, I didn't. And I don't know how people go through hardships without having faith, without having a church, a church body, a church family. You know, people who don't have what we have, like they turn to depression, they turn to addiction, they turn to suicide, but that's not even an option when you know that God's gonna make it better, that you can put your faith in God, even if you don't have the answers right now. And I just like wanna shout it from the rooftops after going through this because it just was so magnified in that time. Coastline just has built up this armor I didn't even know I was wearing. What is life if you're not going through these hard times? And what are you doing with your life if you're not, you know, serving God through it? It's just, it just, it's, it's priceless. It's been a pretty awesome experience. What we had before to what we have now. It's priceless and that's what Coastline is. Well, Reach More is all about, in the short, is stories like that. There are 86% of our community does not go to church. And how many people are going to be facing life crises and, and they're going to need faith, they're going to need hope, they're going to need Jesus to get through the challenges of their life. And what we, what we know God is calling us to do as a church is to make room, to make space, to create space so that more families like that can come and experience what they've experienced through our church. God is using our church because of you, because of your love, because of your compassion, because of your generosity. God is using us, and he's calling us to make space. So over the next few weeks, you're going to hear more and more about that, uh, and, and that's what we want to see is more stories like that, more families that found the faith that they needed to get through the crises of life. And I love that video because it ties in so perfectly to the message today. So if you got your message notes, I want to encourage you to pull those out. Because here's the thing, you're going to face a situation in life at some point in your journey where you're going to need victory. Because the world is trying to overcome you. And you are going to have to learn how to overcome the challenges that are coming against you. And how do you see victory when tragedy happens? How do you see victory when crisis happens? How do you see victory when, when it feels like the entire world is falling down around you? How do you see victory? And what I want to encourage you to do is learn this now before you need it. So that when you need this message, because here, here's what I promise. Every one of us are going to go through challenges in life. 
You're either going into a challenge, in the middle of a challenge, or coming out of a challenge, but we're, we're always going to be facing challenges in our life. Learn this now so that when you need it, you're ready to go. The theme text for us, this series, is 1 John 5, 4. And I encourage you, if you've missed any of the weeks, this is a series that really does tie together. Like, you need each piece of it as the building blocks. The messages can stand alone to a degree, but if you really want to understand each individual message, you've got to put it all together to get the full context of what it means. Because what I've realized is there are many people today who don't know what faith is. They, they, they think faith is a feeling, it's an emotion, it's an attitude. They really don't know what does it mean to walk by faith. 1 John 5, 4, our foundation text is whatever is born of God overcomes the world. So as a believer, you are expected to overcome the world. As a Christian, it is, it is not normal for the world to overcome you. It is not normal as a believer. As a believer, we are called to overcome the challenges of this world, to overcome the tragedies, the crises, the, the battles that we face. We are called by God to be over. Comers. And he says, this is the victory. The victory in that battle that you're going to fight, the victory in that crisis, the victory in that, 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 that challenge, whatever it is, the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. And so we're taking time to understand what is faith, faith that produces victory in our life. Because if we went around the room and we surveyed people, the average person in Christianity today, what is faith? You get all sorts of answers, emotions, attitudes, feelings, and it's none of that. 2 Corinthians 4.13, we looked at this week one. It is written, this is God speaking in the book of Psalms, I believe, therefore I have spoken. And it's talking about the process of faith. And it says, since we have that same spirit of faith, since we have the same spirit of faith that God has, we also believe and therefore speak. So what is faith? Believing and speaking. In the simplest aspect of what faith is, it's believing and speaking. Believing and speaking. It's not believing without speaking. There are many Christians who believe, but they don't say anything, and they fail to activate faith. They believe in their heart, but nothing comes out of their mouth. And so their faith is never activated in their life because they believe, but they don't speak. And then there are other people who speak without believing. They're just kind of making up things they want God to do for them, but they really don't get it rooted in God's word. And that's why last week we looked at faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need the word of God in our life so that God has something to activate when it needs to be active. I don't know how many times in my life I've gone through a challenge and a verse I learned years before all of a sudden lights on fire inside of me. And I now have faith for the challenge that I'm facing. And so my encouragement to you is get God's word inside of you so that God has something to activate when you go through the challenges of your life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So today what we're talking about is the good fight of faith. The good fight of faith. How do you fight the fight of faith? We looked at what faith is. We looked at uh, how faith operates. Now we're talking about the fight of faith. How do we fight the fight of faith? We just watched a video of a family who had to fight the fight of faith for their son in a hospital and had to understand. And and fortunately, over the last seven years at Coastline, they were taught how to fight the fight of faith so that when that time came, they were ready to fight that fight. We need to learn how to fight the fight of faith. 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold, hold, hold. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. What you're going to learn today is the fight of faith is not the fight to get anything from God. It's the fight to hold on to what he's already given. The fight of faith is holding on. And the greatest thing you will ever fight the fight of faith for is eternal life. More than healing, more than miracles, more than this or that, the greatest thing you will ever activate your faith for is eternal life. And let me help you understand eternal life. Eternal life is not going to heaven. That is not eternal life. John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life, that we may know God, the one true living God. Eternal life begins now. It doesn't begin when you get to heaven. Eternal life begins now. It carries on in heaven, but heaven is not eternal life. What eternal life is, is having relationship with God. And there's no greater walk of faith than knowing God. Because how do you know an invisible being? 
Like we know, those of us that are believers, those of us that have experienced it, that God is far more real than the natural world that we live in. But how do you know God if you can't see God? That's what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. The greatest area of faith we will ever exercise in our life is not for miracles, healings, or or, or prayer requests. The greatest area of faith is relationship with him, eternal life. To know the one true God, to trust in what Jesus Christ did at the cross to save our souls. So what I want to do today is I want to, I want to help you understand how to fight the fight of faith. How do you, how do you fight the fight of faith so that when you, when you need the fight of faith, you know how to do it? The first thing is we've got to understand the difference between hope and faith. Hope and faith are incredibly powerful forces of God, but they're different. Now, they do partner together when it comes to faith, but there are times where hope alone can see you through a situation. But you got to understand what hope is and what faith is. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of what you're hoping for. So there's got to be something you're hoping for. For example, I don't hope for a car. I own a car. I don't, I don't need to hope for something that I already have. I hope for what I do not have, and faith is the evidence that I have it before I've received it. It's, it's the evidence of things not seen. Now, there are times where hope alone can get you through a situation, but there are times where hope falls short and you need faith. You need, you need an active faith in your life or you're not going to make it. I think of Admiral James Stockdale, who was a POW after the Vietnam War uh, in, in what was called the, the, the Hanoi Hilton. He spent eight years in this camp being tortured, abused, everything you can imagine. And he comes out of it very positive, uh, very, very hopeful about the future, survived the ordeal, came out, and years later, they were interviewing him on the news. And they asked him, were there people who didn't make it? There were there people who didn't survive? Were there people who, in the camp, just gave up the will to live, and they died in the camp, and they never saw freedom? And he said, oh, yes. He said, who were they? He said, they were the optimists. The optimists. And they asked him, what do you mean by that? He goes, well... They, they, they had this idea that we're going to be out by Thanksgiving. We're going to be out by Thanksgiving. We're, what were they doing? They were believing and speaking. But they were believing and speaking something they didn't have a promise in. They were trying to activate faith, something specific, in an area that, that God had not promised them, or, or, or there was no guarantee. And so we're going to be out by Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving came and went. Okay, we'll be out by Christmas. We'll be out by Christmas. Christmas came and went. We'll be out by Easter. Easter came and went. Eventually, they gave up the will to live. Because they were trying to operate faith, something specific, but they didn't have a promise that it would happen. They asked the Admiral Stockdale, how did you survive? He goes, well, I just, I had this hope that eventually we would win. I didn't know how long it would take. I didn't know how long it would be. I didn't know how it would happen or when it would happen or where it would happen. I just had a hope that it would eventually happen. And hope was a powerful force that got him through that ordeal. But we got to know the difference between hope and faith. Faith is very specific where hope is, hope is a, uh, number one in your notes, hope is a positive expectation of things in the future, whereas faith becomes very, very specific, rooted in a promise. Now, when we fight the fight of faith, God always gives us hope first. It's our imagination. It's a dream. It's a positive expectation of something that God is going to do in our life. You look at Abraham in the Bible. Abraham is known as the father of faith. Out of everybody in the Bible... The Bible uses Abraham as a picture and a model of faith and the process of faith and the fight of faith more than anyone else. We call him the father of faith. Well, here's the truth about Abraham's life. Abraham did not have a 25-year fight of faith. He had a one-year fight of faith. He had 25 years of hope. He had one year of faith. You study Abraham's life, Genesis 12, Genesis 13, Genesis 15. It's hope, hope, hope. God's giving him hope. I will do this for you. You will be. One day it will happen. It was hope, hope, hope. All about the future. And then all of a sudden in Genesis 17, 5, there's a shift. It's no longer about the future. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you, past tense, So it's no longer, I'm going to do this for you one day. You will be the father of a multitude. You will be the father of many nations. Now it's, I've made you a father. Even before him and Sarah had a baby, God said, you are a father now. It is done. Past tense. It's happened in your life. That's what activated the faith. That was the promise. 
You see, up until this point, he had hope that God was going to do this. Now there was a walk of faith, and God changes his name. Abram, which means exalted one, to Abraham, father of a multitude, so that every time he said his name and every time other people said his name, he was believing and speaking the truth of who he was. Even before the child was born, God says, I have made you a father. So number two in your notes, hope says it's going to happen. Faith says it has happened. Faith is always rooted in a promise. God activates something in your life, the word of God in your life, scripture in your life, and all of a sudden, it's done. You can't see it yet. That's why we walk by faith and not by sight. It's not in my hands yet. I walk by faith, not by sight, but it's done. It is no more real when Abraham and Sarah had baby Isaac as it was the day God declared it. Having the baby did not make him any more of a father than the day that God declared it, because the truth was, once God declares it, it's done. It's done. And so we walk by faith and not by sight to hold on to the promise of what God gives us to see that thing eventually take place in our life, in the natural. And that's, that's what's going on here. And so Paul, years later, in Romans chapter 4, he uses Abraham as the example to teach us faith to teach us how to understand, to walk out this process. Romans 4, 16, therefore the promise. There's going to come a time in your life where you're going to need a promise. A promise about a child, a promise about a a, a health situation, a promise about a relate. You're going to need a promise in your life. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, comes by believing and speaking, by faith. Faith comes by hearing. So I need the word of God to be active in my life so that the promise can take place. See, again, this is the difference of hope and faith. In the Greek language, there's two Greek words for the word word. I know it's a little confusing, two Greek words for the word word. When you read the word word in the English language, it could be one of two Greek words. One Greek word is logos, which means the written Bible, the written word of God. That's logos. The other Greek word is rhema. That's the active word of God. That's when God takes the written word and it comes alive inside of you. It begins to glow. It it catches fire. Like you see it just catch fire inside of you and it becomes active and living inside of you. It's not the the logos anymore. It now becomes rhema in your life. Logos gives you hope. Logos tells you what God has the ability to do. God can heal the sick. God can raise the dead. We read that in scripture. That gives you hope of what God can do. Rhema tells you what God's going to do for you personally in this situation. That's the difference. No longer will I make you a father. Now I have made you. You are now a father, even before the baby's born. You are a father. And so we need both in our life. And hearing, hearing is rhema, not logos in that verse we looked at last week. It's hearing the rhema. So we get logos in our life constantly. We read it, we study it, we, we get it inside of us so that, so that we, we, we download enough of it onto the hard drive so that when God needs to activate it, it's in the hard drive. That's why we live in God's word, so that we have it inside of us, so that it can come alive when we need it. So Romans 4, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace. We do not earn miracles from God. We cannot manufacture it. We cannot manipulate God. We can't make it happen. It has to be initiated by grace, guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, which just means New Testament Christians. As it is written, Paul says... I have made you. Look at the tense. He uses Genesis 17. He doesn't use 12, 13, 15. He uses 17. I have made you. Not not will make you one day. I have made you now. Like like it's done. It's already done. You're you're a father right now. Even before the baby's born, you are a father. I've made this to be true. And so it says, he is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. God is an expert at calling something that is not into being. That's how he created the world. Let there be light. There was no light. And he said, let there be light. And and he calls out something that wasn't there into something that now is there. It's how Jesus treated Lazarus. Jesus, Jesus, Lazarus is dead for three days in a tomb. Jesus does not speak to him like you speak to a dead person. Jesus speaks to him like he's alive. He, he's calling those things which are not as if they were reality. Lazarus, come forward. You don't say that to a dead person. You say that to somebody who's alive. God is an expert in this. So remember, hope is the blueprint. 
Hope is the blueprint of what you're believing for. But a blueprint is very, very different than a house. You can have the most incredible blueprint in the world, but if you don't have a, a construction crew, the blueprint alone does nothing. It's the construction crew that builds the blueprint into a home. We need a construction crew. The construction crew for us is faith. Faith, like we said last week, is the force that moves the supernatural into the natural. It's the, it's the construction crew that builds for us. Now, let me be very clear. Calling it a construction crew falls short. Because when you, when you hire a construction crew to build a house, you can go out every day and watch them. Like you can, you can see them putting the frame up. You can see them doing drywall. You can see them doing all You can physically watch it happen. Faith, on the other hand, is not by sight. So a, more, a, a better analogy is it's an invisible construction crew. They're building the house. You just can't see them doing it. Like, like they're... Co- it's an invisible construction crew building the blueprint that you have hope for in your life. Let me illustrate it like this. How many of you, when you were little, had the styrofoam cup that you got at school or church, and, and you put the dirt in it, and you put the seed in it, you watered it, you put it up in the window seal, and you watched it grow? How many of you had the styrofoam cup when you were little? So my brother and I, we, we had the styrofoam cup when we were little. We got it at children's church one Sunday. They were teaching us about, you know, the, the miracle of, of, of God's nature. And so we had, we had a little cups, and we put the dirt in it. We, we buried the seed down, and then we watered it, put it up in the window seal. Three or four days go by. Uh, about the fourth day, we, we go check our cups. And, and in my cup, there's like a little leaf sprouting up from the dirt. Like you see it beginning to pop up. In my brother's cup, nothing. They're like, you don't see anything. A couple days later, my, mine's growing bigger, and now there's like two leaves coming out and a little stem coming up. My brother's cup, nothing. And we were like, what is going on? Because we use the same dirt, we use the same seed, same wind, everything's the same. Why isn't it working? Well, one day we discovered, when we went into the kitchen and we saw, you know, my brother climbed up on the window sill, and every day apparently what he was doing is he, he wanted to watch the process. He wanted to see it happen. So every day he would get his little cup and he would dig up the seed and he would look at the seed <laughs> And then he'd bury the seed, put it back down, and put it up in the window seal. How many of us treat God like that? Like we, we stay up all night long wondering how God's going to do it with anxiety and weird, uh, worry and fear, just trying to figure it out. Like, God, I need to know how you're doing it. I need to know how you're doing it. It's an invisible construction crew. You're not, it's faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. So let me say it like this. In your notes, I don't need faith for what I can see. I need faith for what I can't see. And God is the God of the impossible. God takes hopeless situations. God waited for Abraham and Sarah to be infertile before he gives them faith. Like if this was 10 years earlier, Abraham still had the ability to produce children because we know it through Ishmael. But God waits till they're completely infertile, until it's a supernatural birth that is impossible by human standards. Why? Because there's going to be times in your life when you're going to face something that looks impossible, something that feels hopeless, and you're going to have to have the faith to say, if God could do it for Abraham, he could do it for me. And it's going to give you the faith to get through that season of life. Now, one of the things you've heard me say is we don't, we're not delusional. We don't, we don't ignore the realities or live in denial about what's going on in our life. We just don't dwell on the negative. This is how Abram operated. Romans 4, verse 20. He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. He wasn't looking at the negative realities of his current circumstances. But he was strengthened in his faith. How? Giving glory to God. You know one of the greatest ways you can glorify God is get prayers answered? God wants to answer your prayers. He wants to give you the faith to see the prayer answered in your life. But we've got to do the fight. We've got to do the walk by faith. And here's the thing. God doesn't operate in degrees. Like, we, we want to see things happen in degrees. Like, like I, want, I want to see the plant grow. I want to see the degrees. God doesn't operate in degrees. God, God can have the whole thing built without you seeing it, and then boom, sh- appears one day. And so we've, we've got to learn to walk by faith, not by sight. So with all that said, number three, This is incredibly important for you to understand in this process. The fight of faith is not getting something from God, but it's holding on to what he's already given. You're not fighting the fight of faith for God to give you a miracle. You're not fighting the fight of faith for God to heal you. 
You're not fighting the fight of faith to, to see whatever it is you need to see happen. No, you're fighting the fight of faith to hold on because God's already answered the prayer. God's already given you the miracle. So you're not fighting to get it from God. You're fighting to hold on to what he's already given you. Abram was a father. Even without a child, he was a father. So he wasn't fighting the fight of faith to have a baby. He was fighting the fight of faith to hold on to the truth that God has made me a father. And I got to hold on to that truth so the baby shows up. Let, let me illustrate it like this. Uh, I grew up in Texas. And Texas, you know, they got a lot of a lot of cowboys who like to rope things. And honestly, what that means for me is absolutely nothing. I did not grow up in that part of Texas. My wife's family, they're the cowboys. They, they, know, they know how these things work. Uh, I, I was not a cowboy Texan. I, I wanted to be, but I just, it's just not me. But one of the things the Mexican cowboys, the vaqueros, uh, invented years ago was, was called the, the lariat or, or the lasso, the rope. And the reason they invented it is because they needed the ability to grab hold of something that they could not grab hold of with their hands. And so these steers were wild and they needed to, to, to catch a steer and control a steer and, and grab hold of the steer, but they couldn't do it with their hands. Now, the horse helped at least with the speed, but even on the horse, they still couldn't reach out and grab it. So they needed something to reach out beyond their hands to take possession of something that they could not possess with their hands, at least not at first. And so they, they created the lariat. And so, you know, they, they, would, they would take it and rope it, and I have no idea what I'm doing or how this works, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rope this table. I'm going to impress you. Like, here we go. Nope. All right, one more time. One more time. Here we go. Wow! I know that was impressive. Can you imagine me riding a horse and doing that? So let's say the table is the miracle I'm believing God for, right? So the fight of faith is not to get the table. The fight of faith is to hold on to the table. I have the table. I have the table right now. I don't have it in my hand. I have it by faith. This lasso, I want you to, I want you to think about faith as an invisible lasso. So the fight of faith is not for God to give me the table. God's already given me the table. I, I have that table right now by faith. So the fight of faith is not for God to give me the table. He's already given me the table. The fight of faith is to hold on to the promise before it shows up physically in my life, before it manifests, before the fruit of it arrives in my life. That's the fight of faith. That's why Hebrews says, do not throw away your confidence. Don't let go of the rope. Because if you hold on, you'll be richly rewarded. So here's how the fight of faith works. You're holding on to the promise by faith. God's given you a word. He's given you a scripture. He's given you a verse. He's given you something. And you're, and you're standing on faith with that thing. And you're holding on to the promise by faith. And, and here's what the enemy does. The enemy comes up and starts whispering in your ear. What are you holding on for? God's not going to do that for you. Don't you remember your past? Don't you remember those horrible things you did years ago? You really think God's going to answer your prayer? You really think God's going to give that to you? You're not good enough. You don't deserve it. You don't read your Bible enough. You don't pray enough. God, God, God's not going to answer your prayer. I mean, look at you. Look, look at the way you live your life. Look at your past. Look at the things you've done. Why do you think God's going to answer your prayer? And here's what happens to many believers. They're holding on. Like God answered the day they prayed. That happened in the book of Daniel. The day he prayed, God said, I heard an answer, but there was, a, there was a battle in the heavenlies for 21 days before the answer showed up. God answered the day you prayed. You had it by faith the day you prayed. But now you got to fight the fight of faith because, because there's, there's a period of time between when God answers and when you see the answer, and that's the fight of faith. And so you're fighting to hold on. You're fighting to hold on, and, and Satan's lying to you. You're not good enough. You look at the things you've done in your past. Why do you think God's going to answer you? God's not going to answer your prayer. And so here's what many believers do. They let go. They let go of the miracle, of the answer. Be, be, I mean, sometimes they, they, they let go like days before it showed up. How many Christians missed out on answered prayers? How many things have, have we lost in our life because we, we let go of our faith before it showed up? We started believing the lie of the enemy. 
This is why believing and speaking is so important. Let me give you this key truth in the fight. I cannot control what I think, but I can control what I say. This is the fight. I can't control what I think. I'm going to worry. I'm a human being. I'm going to have fear. I'm a human being. I'm going to have anxiety. I'm a human being. I can't control what comes into my mind. Satan is going to put all sorts of stuff into my mind. I can't control what comes into my mind, but I can control what I say. And here's the dangerous part of worry. You're going to worry. You're a human being. Worry is going to come into your mind. It's critically important. You do not allow worry to get from your mind to your heart. You cannot allow worry to get in your heart. When worry gets into your heart, it devastates your life. You're going to have worry in your mind. Don't let it get into your heart. How do you stop worry from getting into your heart? You got to let it out on the second floor. So you got like the third floor up here, worry comes into your mind, and then it starts taking this elevator down to the heart. You got to let it out on the second floor. You got to let it out on the second floor. You, you, got, you got to begin to speak truth over it. You got, to, you got to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. You got to learn to walk by believing and speaking. Believing and speaking. Believing and speaking and not by sight because what I'm seeing is scary. And Satan is lying to me and he's trying to get me to let go of my faith. And so I've got to walk by faith. Lord, you've told me this is going to happen. You've told me that whoever says to the mountain, be thou removed and does not doubt, but believes in their heart and says with their mouth that it'll be done, Lord. So I'm just going to believe and speak the truth. I'm going to believe and speak the promise that you've given me, God. I've got all of these lies coming into my mind. I've got all this worry coming into my mind, but I'm going to, I'm going to do something out loud. And it begins to change things. That's why Joshua says, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. It doesn't say from your mind, it says your mouth. It doesn't say your mind, it says your mouth. See, a lot of people think reading the Bible is enough. Getting it in their mind is enough. No, it needs to be in your mouth. There, there's a speaking element to this. And so in your notes, the, the point I put there is to believe in my heart, my heart, I must say with my mouth. Because Jesus said, out of the mouth, the heart speaks. So to believe in my heart, I must say in my mouth. And then Psalm 91 says, I will say of the Lord, I will trust. So sometimes I say first out of obedience, and then my heart begins to believe it. And sometimes I believe it, and so I say it. And so sometimes I say it, and then I believe it, and sometimes I believe it, and then I say it. And sometimes I say it, and then I believe it, and sometimes I believe it, and then I say it. Because faith is not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's not an attitude. It's a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. I choose to forgive even if I don't feel like it. Faith is a choice. I choose to believe God's word. I choose to speak God's word. And when I believe and I speak, my heart believes it. And when my heart believes it, I speak it. When I speak it, my heart believes it. And it just reinforces. But the key is my tongue has got to be involved because my ears need to hear it. I don't need to think it. I need to hear it. And so let me give you number four. You've heard us say this a lot in our church. Faith declares God's truth over our current reality. Faith declares God's truth over our current reality. Current reality may say cancer. Faith says Jesus paid for all of my sickness and disease at the cross 2,000 years ago. That's the truth. The truth is all of my sickness was paid for. The truth is I'm healed. Reality may say cancer. Truth says healed. So I'm not, again, I don't live in denial. I'm not delusional. I go to the doctor because God may, God may heal me physically through medical practice, or he may heal me supernaturally. I don't know. It's up to him. I just get to decide whether or not I'm going to believe in truth or if I'm going to live in fear over reality. I still handle reality. And this is Abram. Abram acknowledged what was going on in his body. He just didn't, he just chose not to walk by it, not to live by it. Yeah, this is going on in my body, but I'm going to declare truth over the situation. With my tongue, I'm going to speak truth over the situation. I'm still going to the doctor, but I'm going to speak truth over the situation. I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. And this is what Jesus taught in Mark 11 as we close. I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, look at this, believe that you received it. Jesus doesn't say believe that you will receive it. He says believe that you already have received it. Look at that. Believe that you've already received it. Don't believe that you will receive it. Believe that you've already received it. Past tense. And when you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. This is huge. 
Have you ever noticed in the Bible when Jesus would heal somebody, he didn't do a victory dance? Like, like he, he would raise the dead or, or open blind eyes. And he's like, wow, I can't believe it worked today. Like he was never surprised. How many of you, when you walk into a room and turn on the light switch, are surprised that the light turned on? Man, I can't believe it worked today. No, you expect the light to turn on when you turn the switch on. When you walk by faith, you're grateful every time God moves, but you're not excited or surprised. That's the fight of faith. The fight of faith is to get you into a place where you're not going to be surprised when it happens because you expected it to happen because it's true. That's the fight of faith. You're grateful when it happens, but you're you're not like overly excited about it. I, I remember... In 30 years of ministry, I've seen many people healed. I've seen people that couldn't get pregnant, get healed and get pregnant. I've seen different miracles. And I've never, like, gotten all that excited over it. And I, and I used to feel like I'm a bad pastor. Like, what's wrong with me? I should be, like, super excited. This miracle just happened. And the Holy Spirit said to me one day, well, you expected it to happen. Like, you don't get excited for what you expect to happen. You're grateful for it. You give glory for it, but, but you're not, like, Oh, wow, I can't believe it worked. No, you expect it to work. That's what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. 